Welcome to the Own It Powercast, the place to be when you get serious about making big changes and accelerating growth in your life and in your relationships. Finally create the life you've always wanted, living life on your own terms. Learn how to take your fear and turn it into powerful choices that will create sustained change. Now your host, Mary Baker. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Own It Powercast the place to come to get what you need to move yourself forward. Hey, it's Mary Baker, and welcome to episode 171. Seeing clearly, activating your superpower for being okay with the raw facts of where you are. Well, if you've been with us all month, you know we've been focused on making time to sit with ourselves and about getting clear with where we are. Well, I'm really excited to introduce my guest today, who I see as a kindred soul in this very work. James Hepner is a results coach and the founder of Weekly Wins and Losses podcast and Weekly Global Community Call. He helps people in their journey to embrace all of life, both the wins and the losses equally. James helps you firmly establish the mental and physical courage that's needed to do difficult things while guiding you to achieve your ability to leverage the good news that lies at the heart of both a win and a loss. People from around the world find James when their way of handling losses just no longer works, and when leaving 50% of life on the table is no longer an option. His current client list ranges from well-known professionals and executives to average ordinary humans, both of which are deeply hungry and curious towards the worthy work of breaking into and establishing a brand new dimension of life. So let's get to my interview with James. I really got jazzed about it because talking about helping people find clarity and and like we were talking about all month on the show, we've been getting into how to get grounded, how to get the toxic away from you, how to take time so that you can actually listen to yourself Hmm. and or listen to the answers, you know, that need to come to you. I mean, some people look for external guidance. Maybe they're more spiritual, right? Things like that. So I think the answers can come to people in many different ways. But I wanted to talk to you today about how do you help your clients find clarity? How do you help them get in touch with that? But before we do that, I want you to tell us a little bit about you and what brought you to this specific type of work with your clients. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, firstly, I just want to say thank you for having me on. And I just deeply honor your work. And you and I, when we had a connection, uh, we we grounded straight into some pretty deep stuff pretty quick. And we kind of had some nice laughs. Because, you know, all of life, we need to, I think we need to find a humor in all of it and uh, to connect with all of it is, 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 is kind of a beautiful thing and it can be a stretching thing, right? So, <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what called me or what brought me into this space of personal growth? I am, let's just say it like this, people call me the self-help hacker. And so, um, you know, we all know there's this whole biohacking movement going on. And though I like that space, but uh, people know me as someone who knows a whole bunch of uh, many different modalities. And I'm pretty well studied and pretty well learned. And one of the things that my clients really appreciate about me is that I will find, just by listening pretty quickly, the master switch in the depth somewhere within the psyche. And so we all know that our initial response is the thing that is buried way within. So before we even have time to cognitively think about how we're going to respond, that thing shows up. We're like, why is that? (laughs) You know, what can I do about it? And so here's the thing. When we do heavy work in a light way, when we go deep down inside, not to blame and shame, but we're like, oh, that's interesting. That's there. And that's there probably as your solution. Uh, And when we become aware that uh, maybe that solution, we're, we're actually not gaining as much as we thought we were by using that. We can upgrade our solution to something a little different. So I'm a strength finder, you know, mm-hmm. let's say it like this. I've been married for 22 years to the exact same woman. I've been with her for 27 years. And Meg always says that I became a feminist before she ever did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she was raised in a home where there's plenty of 
you know, emotional abuse going on. And one of the one of the reasons that I really wanted to be with her is I just didn't think that that was cool. I didn't think that was right. Of course, I, I, I you know, my heart was beating for her. Uh, but uh, one of the things that I've always been about, I was raised on the farm. My parents would say I was the only one out of their five children that when they had a dog, and we had a few of them every now and again, um, I was the only one that would genuinely just pet the dog, not because the dog needed to give me anything. I just wanted to connect with the dog and I could feel with what the dog was going through. Mm-hmm. And so it, it's one of those things where I naturally have a bend towards feeling pain. And it's probably because I myself feel a whole bunch. I, I can feel a wide array of emotions. And uh, so depth of pain, depth of joy, depth of sorrow, and uh, I've just always been like this. And of course, that's led me down some interesting paths. Uh, they haven't all been glorious. <laughs> uh, let's say it like this, because of course, what do we do typically as a human? We are a certain way. And then we finally say, why is this? So we go from not really wanting it from within. And then we go to flat out rejecting it from within. And of course, that's what right. society does. If we don't want it, they don't want to see it in us because we don't, we're not enjoying ourselves. And they're like, You're, you don't look happy. So we don't want it for you either. Then we go about rejecting it in ourselves, and society goes, oh, we can do that too. So they reject it with us. And then finally we get exhausted and they're like, oh, you know, and finally when we're exhausted, then we go and yeah. we just let it down and we let it go. We're like, actually, why don't I just accept it? And we're like, accept it? Like I've been all my life fighting this thing. And so when we finally just let it appear mm-hmm. to our chagrin, not only do we enjoy ourselves a little more, society goes, you accept it. You, this looks great on you. So we love it too. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. <laughs> so, so I think, so to your play, you know, getting grounded, getting some of that toxic away, you know, getting to that place of clarity. I think when I see that whole landscape, I think we all have a desire to build a relationship with power in a healthy way. Right. And I just begin by saying power in the pause and the divine mm-hmm. feminine. So the feminine is often the interior world. The masculine right. is often, they, the masculine has more of a relationship with the exterior world. Mm-hmm. And so the divine feminine, the power in the pause is actually the gift and the power of the feminine to say, let's just pause. Let's just take a moment to process what's going on. When you don't process, you're not onboarding much, if any. And so when I think about lasting, lasting change, that's called transformation. You talk about on your show. I love it. It all comes from behavioral change. Right. And and behavioral change is, I think, and I like to hear your thought on it, but I think behavioral change comes from, and just tapping back into that last play, I said, first, we don't really like how we are. Then we flat out reject it. And then finally, we accept it. I think behavioral change comes when we finally let things in. What do you think about that? Like let life in, let light shine in, let life, whatever is, let it be, let it come in. You know, what's your thinking on that? Oh, perfect. Because I think that when we allow, we surrender to what is versus trying Mm -hmm. to control and make things happen, which is all control is fear-based. And so when you're fear-based, you're trying to control outcomes, impression management, Mm -hmm. play it safe, don't risk, don't screw up. All that perfectionism keeps people stuck, Mm -hmm. I think, because you're not risking. You're not just allowing your intuition to guide you to something really cool. And it's letting go of outcomes and allowing whatever truth is supposed to happen for you happen. But that's letting go of control. Mm -hmm. But I don't think we can be genuine and authentic until we do. When you said a moment ago, what's that immediate answer in the first nanosecond? That supposedly is our truth before we PC it, before we say, oh, I couldn't do that. Or they'd be pissed off if I tried that. Or how in the world could I afford that? And all the fears come up. But our truth is there and just tapping into that is really important. But I think you you can't do both. You can't allow and then try to control things at the same time. Yeah, and I think that, and you know, I love the way you set that up. You said it so eloquently, you know, allowing, there's no room for control. Allowing, genuine allowing is allowing. It's like wanting it as it is. Now, you might not, that doesn't mean you agree with how it is. But the first thing, I think the first step to anything is you got to actually just want to experience what you're currently experiencing. So listeners, f- just feel this. If you if you have a certain emotion, why don't just allow yourself to feel it? Why 
Why desire to rush beyond it? Why desire to think I should be somewhere else and this emotion isn't good? Why not just pause and allow yourself to experience and ask yourself, well, to be totally honest, this is where I am. And then ask yourself, has it ever worked for me to flee my own presence? It doesn't work. <laughs> wow. And so the more, right. You, right? And the more, so the more you try to push away from what you're experiencing, it'll just come back to haunt you more. Like we all tend to shove our demons into this little haunted house beside us. We all try to push it down and hope that nobody sees it. Right. Um, you know, I have a little thing and I just, I keep reminding my clients, I keep reminding myself, of course, because first it, it must be of me and must be of you if you help people, right? This is what we do as, right. you know, as students of life and, and, and they're the support of the people. You have to know where you are so that you know where you're going. If you cannot be okay, if you, if you choose not to allow, and that's the word, choose, if you choose not to allow the feels to be an experience and to let it and just absorb it. Like all emotions are actually safe if we let them be. Because emotions are just there to prime us towards the next proper action. And again, you didn't hear me say the right action. Because if we think about right and wrong, that's what stucks us. Yep. Stucks us is we're like, well, actually, I don't want to do the wrong thing. So maybe I just don't do many things. And so, you know, I'm an amateur, you know, on many things. But I, for example, there's some spiritual teachings, people will say, well, you want to take the right step. Well, I kind of wonder about this because, and listeners tap into this, if you ever task yourself with the pressure of do the right thing, how how um, energetic are you to participate with the thing? <laughs> <laughs> honestly, you're in contemplation. Right. And honestly, I mean, studies have shown now only 2% of your life is logic. The masculine energy often considers why could we not just separate and categorize emotion from logic, but that we know that doesn't work. You cannot separate these things. And emotion actually holds 98% of our life. That's, that's how much of our life is emotion. Only 2% is logic. So there's a myth of rationality. And the divine mm -hmm. feminine, when they drop into this space, mm -hmm. you begin to realize that there is mystery and there is, sorry, mystery and beauty I mean sheer beauty when you lean in and ask yourself, well, listen, this is how I'm currently feeling. So know where you are. This is how it is. Not right or wrong, not good or bad. Right. This right. is just where I'm at. And so it's like, a, you know, your child. Think about if you have a child or if you have a friend and your friend gets a grade on a, you know, on an exam or, you know, going for their doctorate and they get, into, you know, their, their, their grade point average, whatever it ends up being is X. And I think we as humans, we need to... We need to just sit with when we have that conversation with our with our child or a friend and they get that mark. The good news is that you got a mark. The mm. mark just tells you where you're at. It, it's not identity. It just tells you where you are because unless you see where you are and you're always fleeing from the reality and the authenticity of that, unless you do that, unless you can stomach that, you're always going to have an anxious presence and fleeing from who you actually are. In that moment, you are a 70% average math student. Okay, fair enough. I'm a 49% person who, or I'm a 30. doesn't matter. But you, your power comes, in my opinion. Power in the pause. Wait a minute. Society says, in my mind, society says having a 49% average on math is bad. But let's just pause for a second. Just hang on a half a, half a hot second. And then when you pause, often what happens is you feel pressure building up. And when pressure builds up, if you pause, pressure turns to presence because you're pressed from all sides and all you can eventually do is be present with it. Yep. And the more present you become with it, the more peace that begins to formulate because peace isn't found out there. Peace is created from within. It's something that you do. Peace is something you bring. It's something you do. And the more peace you bring, the more purpose you you wake up to your inner purpose, what you were always given, and the more passionate you become. And this is where you have authority within your own life. Wow. Wow. Right. There's so much there. I was like, I should have taken notes just listening to you. <laughs> so, yes, I agree. That acceptance of who you are, I also think, builds self-trust and then mm. helps us listen to ourselves more so that you are or, or and or you become more in touch with what's true about you. 
what your purpose is, is what's true about you, what your gifts are, mm -hmm. what you're here for, where you're supposed to go, what's, what's going well in your life, what do you want to change, mm -hmm. um, where do you feel like you fit, right? Mm -hmm. Like, even people who aren't spiritual that I work with, they get the idea of a fish on a bicycle mm -hmm. when they've been there. Mm -hmm. And I agree with you wholeheartedly. It's really about running from the self. Mm -hmm. Because as I work with people, and they work on boundaries, and they work on trying to get present with themselves, and they work on healing, oftentimes, a lot of trauma that made them have to disconnect with who they are, the answers come for them. Their truth comes. It was always there. It's about more like remembering, right, mm -hmm. is what we're told, than finding yourself. It's really just getting, it's always been there. You've always been there. But the fear and the running from the self, it is crucial. And I think it goes away as people work on healing all that anxiety, all that control stuff, learn how to sit and be in their own skin over time. For some people, that takes time. For a lot of people, the moment was scary when they were kids and being yelled at or shamed or ridiculed or bullied mm -hmm. or questioned. You know? And so... How do you work with your clients to practice having more ease with just sitting with self? You know, I think what comes to heart for me, we can all choose if we're going to serve the God of production and the God of entertainment. And oftentimes, mm. the reason I bring that up, oftentimes we hear people talk about, well, yeah, you know what? the the noise out there is so loud the media you know we point over there but the power is not there the point the power is in here mm. and so we can focus on all the things that are just apparently grabbing our control or we can just grab the reins of our life and when we do that we realize that maybe they aren't all evil it's just what they were doing is mm -hmm. when, when society doesn't grab the reins of our life somebody's got to do it and then somebody's willing to direct you to their website so you can go buy more of this vitamin and on and on and on right someone's very willing to do that mm -hmm. and so when you begin to tap into the signal that you are and i often say this increase the signal to noise ratio mm. There's so much noise but increasing the signal i think to set up your day where the first part of your day is you, building a relationship with you. And what I mean to say is strength i found. So one of the things that I do with my clients, it's an inner practice that I bring into my life, and I've done this for years and years, and I help other people get to this place. And it is, when you think about love, love is, is a word that oftentimes I find anyway, people like to use when they're overwhelmed. So they just say, well, there's always love. And then they just kind of, we'll just give it to love. You know what I mean? It's one of these things. <laughs> when I think love, what is love? Love is the ability to give and the ability to receive. And when you look at it in the mainstream, so the noise out there typically would say, well, you'll see if what you're doing works, but if you give, you'll see if you get karma back. Then you know, then you know if it works, if it stress tests out. So the myth of rationality is just everywhere. <laughs> right. 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 But the only only thing is, love actually is a give and receive, not at a different time. The give and receive happens at the exact same time. Mm. So when you think of your heart, I want you, you know, to just envision if let's say there's a, a valve where the blood comes in and a valve where the blood goes out. And I know there's many more valves <laughs> going on, but just think mm. for simplicity's sake, in and out. Imagine one valve, the bottom valve is closed. But the top one's open. What's going to happen? Your blood's going to, you know, going to rush in, but it's not going to go anywhere. So it's not going to pump vital nutrients to the other organs. So if you're just right. giving and waiting for a receive, and how many people don't give in life? So they put good vibes into the world. And then they're going, well, I'm doing what I say or what they say I should do to live a good life, which is to serve others. Mm -hmm. The only thing is if you are in wait mode, that's the suffering mode. Now, mm. I'm not saying pause can't be a wait and let's see what happens. Of course, let's see, let's see, like let nature, we have to wrap around nature, not nature, you know, around us. It doesn't work that way. Right. We have to wrap around the reality what is. 
But if you think about, so the first part of my morning, what I help my clients do is build a helpful and depth relationship with what it looks like to have both valves open at the same time. Because if you're just giving and the bottom valve is closed, the heart doesn't work. That the heart has to be open at the top and at the bottom. So when you give, you receive at the exact same time. So listeners, I want you to try this. I want you in this moment to just be gracious with yourself. Speak kindly to yourself. Just do something internally. So give toward yourself something of value and of purpose and of meaning or just something that makes you feel warm. Try it on. And then I want to ask you a question. When you gave it to yourself, didn't you receive it at the exact same time? Mm. And because you receive it at the exact same time, that's what real love looks like. And when you build that musculature, so the first part of your day, when you get out of bed, the first part of your day, it's like putting an oxygen mask on you. I know we feel like we need to go make sure the kids are okay and this is okay and that's okay. But you have to make sure that you are in a position to lead well. Lead yourself well to begin with before we get too on the high horse, all the noise, go serve, go serve, so serve, so that there might just be enough for you if you serve enough. Oh my goodness, that's scarcity. Yeah, it sure is. You need to be quiet and everything. The power of the pause, just hang on a second before I buy that narrative of, I better make sure that I can anxiously progress to some perceived finish line. What the f***? Pardon the language, but what is that? You know what I mean? Right. Slow it down and be like, I am here and I am here to be what? Do we want to be people who say we're givers, but genuinely we're takers? And this is what it looks like. If you're ever waiting for something to return, if you're ever waiting for what you give to return, my argument is you're a subtle taker. And here's what I mean to say. A couple of years ago, I planted two rows of carrots. I love a little bit of gardening work, putting hands in the dirt. Mm -hmm. One row was a set of uh, exotic purple carrots. And I like to plant mm. unique things. Just try, just see what happens, right? I like it. See mm -hmm. if I can nurture them to life. And I like it. Mm -hmm. And I planted right next to that row of carrots, just your traditional orange carrots. And of course, they're all non-GMO and organic. I love that kind of world. And so I plant these things and I take pristine care of both rows. Pristine care. I got organic soil. Everything is just laid out in lush and I got the right sunshine. I got the water on it. It's fantastic. Would you know that only one row, just the purple carrots, start growing through the soil? I think this is strange. So I give a little extra energy to the orange row. Fast forward, season of growing is over. The only harvest that I that I get to partake in is the purple carrots. The orange carrots didn't grow. And so what happened is I thought to myself, well, that was useless. As I'm pulling out the purple carrots, I look at the orange row and I think, that was totally useless. Look, I gave all that effort. It didn't really help mm -hmm. anything. Look, I just gave and I was waiting for this to happen and I was waiting to see if it was going to work and it didn't work. I'm not doing those orange. That was ridiculous. Who cares? That orange carrot roll, forget it. And all of a sudden, I stood up and I just started weeping because mm -hmm. I realized that I had given to this orange row of carrots. I had given thinking it was genuine love, but it was actually, I was taking, I wasn't giving, I was expecting. I can only support something if I would generate a harvest. Right. And I said, never, ever again. Mm. And so that's when I began to build that inner musculature because here's the thing, before your day begins, listeners, think about this, when your children, your husband or husband, your wives, whatever expectations or things that you that you need to bring so that you can, you know, put groceries, you know, in the fridge, whatever it ends up being that how whatever you feel drawn to, if you have a business, doesn't matter. All of these things, before that ever shows up in your day, you want to have such a strong musculature towards giving and receiving at the exact same time. So that when your day begins, you're not looking for, am I enough? Am I worthy? And you're subtly always a taker and you're just pulling little things from people that you are good, that you are good and you can receive well. So you build a healthy relationship, which by the way, the feminine is the receiver. The masculine is the doer. The woman needs to, for example, my wife, she had to learn how to ground herself back to the root, like you say, to remember who she really was. And she shows up primarily in her feminine. Like, she, Of course, we have masculine and feminine both you know, within us. Of course, we mm -hmm. know this. But she shows up mostly as a feminine person. And it was very hard for her to receive because as a receiver, 
you sometimes have to ask for things yeah. and let other people serve you. And that's very, oh, it, it takes a lot of courage to happen, right? So I hope this is making sense when I say in general, you know, we all want love, but love's a big deal. Love's this big, wide open. We don't understand it. And I think love, we have to understand it from within first. And the only way I can explain it, the only way that it works is you cannot wait to receive. When you give, you receive at the exact same time because what you put out into the universe in love, if you are ever waiting in any measure of time, then what you're actually doing is you're not loving. What you're actually doing is you're putting something out there because you need something back and that's not love. That's control. That's control. In the adage is, if you have an agenda as to how that should play out, you need to go back to the drawing board. Exactly. That isn't love. It's fear that if if I don't give to that person and they don't think I'm fabulous, I'm not okay. So it, it actually does become about taking because you're taking identity. It's like, he's pissed at me today because he's having a bad day, but now I've made it about me and now I'm not okay as a person. Like the math doesn't work. The math doesn't, exactly. What we're supposed to do is when we get up in the morning, what you're saying is be with self and then go do things just because it feels like the right thing to do. But let the chips fall. You know, maybe your child's in a rotten mood this morning, you know, but you just love them anyway and you get them off to school because you feel mm -hmm. that you want to love. But you're right, disconnecting that from the outcome. What expectations do I have? Because, you know, expectations are really pre-planned resentments, right? You just set yourself right. up. That's good. I love that. Mm -hmm. But that's really just running the universe today, right? And I have days like that, too. Like, yeah, I'm in charge. Okay. So, and if we can have these issues and be so unaware of them because control is so insidious and it looks like love to people. It looks like caring. It looks like all this serving, right? And it's hard for my clients to really, it takes them a while to understand like that's not love, that's control. Love is choice. Love is you're going to love you your go. spouse, mm -hmm. whether they're nice to you today or mm -hmm. not, whether mm -hmm. they think you're fabulous for what you gave them for their birthday, let's mm -hmm. say, and, and that you can be okay as a person. Yeah. And I think, you know, and just if you don't mind, I, I you know, I like your thought on this, but I've realized within my life and the journey I've had and the clients that I support, and we can either say life is happening to us or for us. And, and mm. people go, yeah, I've heard that a million times, but how does that stress test out? And, and how does that play out on my life? And I would just have to say something like, I think love is when you say, because of, not in spite of. Like when your husband does something you don't like, or your right. child does something, or your wife your partner, whatever this ends up being, or you get fired from a job or the market crashes. Right. If ever you decide that there will be certain things that will trap you, you just sold your freedom. Whoa. But if you decide that nothing traps me, everything frees me. And that's not changing the facts from negative to positive because we don't need to make negative a bad thing. It is what it is. There's joy found in the morning when the sun comes up, morning, that kind of morning, right. but also joy found in the M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. And unless we have preference for both, unless we build musculature to be able to handle both and to say, listen, I get to decide. I don't need to change the facts. I don't have to be afraid of the mourning, of the crying. Right. It's an emotion. It's what we want. The depth of your tears equals will create the depth of your joy. Mm -hmm. I agree. So I love what you said. Expectations are pre-planned resentments. You know, on that point, you know, when I think about naturally wanting to honor ourselves who doesn't naturally want to honor think about it when you get up in the morning what's the first thing you want we all want the same thing by the way for and you know this <laughs> I, I know we talked about this but we all want the same thing we all want to give more love and receive more love that's what we want constantly right some people just go through method and optics where they have to wait for a tremendous amount of time before they feel love like first they need to feel significant and then they need to create certainty or have certainty from the world before they can experience love so they go through many things and we get to decide if we bring our value of love up or we can meet that before we do these other things so there is just something we need to decide on and that's kind of the work that i do but what's interesting is this when you consider what you really want is love you want to feel love you want to experience it when you wake up in the morning and if you look over, like chances are your spouse doesn't wake up at the exact same time you do or your partner or your child or mm -hmm. your dog doesn't wake up at the exact same time you do. So why would you wait even for a second? 
if you want to honor what you want to experience, I think the best thing in life is when we bring it, when we bring it naturally. That's when we turn back to the womb of how we were created. When you give yourself what you're looking for, which is that Mm self-love. And it's not selfish. If anything, it is the most beneficial. It's naturally aligning. When you think about it, when you treat yourself kindly, you can finally start accepting what's happening out there. Thank you. That's it. Yep. That's it. And when, when you can start accepting what's out there, you can start participating with with what's out there in, in, in a non-anxious way. Mm-hmm. I agree with you. I think if the shame sponge is full, shame is who I am, guilt is what I've done. Shame is who I am. As we wring out the shame sponge with self-love, self-acceptance, compassion, reality, you know, we're not making excuses for ourselves. I help people grab context. Like, mm-hmm. you don't act that way in a vacuum. Sorry, none of us. I just don't do vacuums. I just don't believe in them <laughs> Not when it comes to dysfunctional <laughs> behavior, right? Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. I'm like, you struggle with defensiveness, let's say, for a reason. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't have to carry that forever. You can let it go and you can understand with compassion. That was a coping mechanism that helped you survive, damn it. You wouldn't be here right now, right? And they get that. I'm mm-hmm. like, if you didn't have that coping mechanism, it's you'd beautiful. be- you would be, I don't know, in the alley still shooting heroin or probably dead. Mm-hmm. You would not mm-hmm. be here. You wouldn't have this great job. You wouldn't be a good mom. I mean, and so I think that you're right that it's all an inside out job anyway. We can't mm-hmm. give another what we mm-hmm. don't have. So you're saying by getting up in the morning and taking a moment for self love, and I'm also hearing gratitude, like looking over at your spouse and being grateful. Yeah, you, you know what? That that is so good. Wow. There's not many things in life that are outside of who we are that we can control even in the slightest. Right. Right, <laughs> exactly. My woman who isn't like this, by the way, who can be controlled. Can't be because every human is slightly different. Every human has a bit of a different energy set about. I look at my woman every day and I do different what I than what I did for the first six years of my life. For the first six years, I'm like, I'm getting to know her better and better. And finally, like, I got her figured out. <laughs> <laughs> and she nicely served me notice that that wasn't possible because she doesn't have herself figured out. <laughs> and so she would be like, that's kind of cute. You got me figured out. I don't have me figured out. That's really fascinating because I'm going to serve you notice that I keep changing. Okay. Right. So, <laughs> so if you think you got me figured out, how do you figure out what's changing? Right. I think I like your thought on this. I think, you know, and I love your play on shame and guilt, the difference of, and the beauty of guilt. Think about this. You got to know where you are to know where you're going. Mm -hmm. How, what do you allow to come over you that allows you to correct? Some people say correct course. I just call it connect with the course of your life. You get to connect with what's there. So you get to connect. Guilt has you see your behaviors. Mm Mm-hmm. Guilt, guilt doesn't be, need to be a heavy. Guilt just is like, oh, I saw that's what happened. I want to now reconnect. Actually, I didn't feel that good when I did that. Plus, if I'm observing society, I don't think I feel very beneficial, nor are they reflecting back to me right. that what I, my behaviors were helpful. So I don't feel really good about this whole thing. And we humans have, we all have this. We're all regenerative beings. Like if we are, are takers and not supporting more of life to life, then we're like, yeah, I don't think that was so good. And the beautiful thing is it's a setup. It's all coming back to love. <laughs> it is. When we put something out there that doesn't benefit, the world goes, yeah, I'm not quite so sure about that. Like, this doesn't look really regenerative. It's not really loving. So, I, I you know, I don't think so. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. And right. so guilt is, guilt is something where we go like, oh, I get to connect firstly without shame. This is what I did. And then I think the exercise for me and my clients, and I, you know, I can hear it to a large degree. This is what I imagine. I can only imagine. I don't want to put words in. So I, you know, I best be backing out of this one. I don't want to say I'm not doing it and then I'm doing it. But we first need to get curious about why we chose that solution. Right. Like for the person, for right. the person that murdered someone. I mean, it sounds really demonstrous. Like you murdered, that, that, that sounds really harsh. The only thing is the person that murdered someone, they're sitting in jail. And if they reflect back, before you go a bunch of shame and now you go, this is who I am and I'll always be like this. Well, now you're just caught in identity crisis. Right. But if you lean into the guilt, you'll be like, wait a minute, why did I choose a solution? Because psychology will share with all of us that a human never 
acts its own problem. It never does. It acts its solution. So then mm -hmm. us as the observer, observing the person who committed the crime, we observe what he did or she did committing that murder as a problem. That's what we see. But if we're not careful, if we inflict this on the other and we shame them so intensely, what are the chances of them just benefiting from the gift of guilt? Meaning they just need to see what they did and be like, oh, I chose a solution. And so here's to the play. I chose it because really what I wanted to, is to be noticed. Right. But, but really what I wanted is love. So here's how I got noticed. I created this big scene, massive significance. Mm -hmm. I shot a person, somebody with, you know, had a video camera. And, and I did this because I wanted to feel like very certain that finally something was going to come my way and somebody's going to pay attention to me. And so you're going through all the needs right. before you feel love. And then at the end, they'd be like, and then guess what? Now in prison, I'm reflecting back and I'm seeing myself on the television and I'm seeing how I committed the crime. It's right there. And now I finally can feel like, okay, so now I feel all these things. So now I can feel finally feel love. And then that person gets a gets the chance if we don't shame and also if if they're in that moment where they get to look and be like, actually, that was a solution for me to get the love that I wanted, but I'm realizing I'm actually losing more than I'm gaining because I'm going to be in this slammer for 25 years. I'm losing a lot more than I'm gaining. And then they get to up level their solution to something different. Exactly. And so I think we have to be empathetic. We have to be grateful. We have to be able to look at where we are and be like, incredible. This is where I'm at. I wonder why I did this. This is cur I'm curious. Why? Because if I look at society, they're all not appreciating why did I think instead of being like, I'm the common problem, just a half a second. You did this because you're doing what we're all doing. That's trying to get back to love. It's just you took the long road. You don't need to take the long road. You can do it differently, right? Right. That is so amazing. I love how you said that because what that pretty much says is that's a good person made a bad exactly. choice. Trying to get love, trying to get needs met, right? We're going to, I think, I, I'm binary on very few things. One of them is this, you, me, him, anybody. I'm going to get needs met in a healthy way or an unhealthy way, but I'm getting met, damn it. All right. I'm only going to sit on the fence. It's going to leak out sideways. I'm going to act out. You will pay attention to me right now, right? I will be on TV. Yes. Yeah. Um, hilariously, right? But but yeah, seriously, true. W when, I, when I watch people transform mm. and grow, like, they get disgusted with that kind of stuff. Like, ew, you know, they're like, Mary, God, I got defensive yesterday. It was gross. I don't like that. I don't be that anymore. But the other thing you're also saying is if a person feels like they can choose differently, everything changes. Everything changes because now they can have a part two or part mm -hmm. three or four of their life that looks very different than the previous. The research shows Two things. One, there's a positive correlation between guilt and behavior mm. change and a negative mm. correlation between shame and doing anything better in your life, right? And, and the other thing is, is that the research also shows that people who change their values, like what's guiding their life, their beliefs and their values, that's how they also atone for themselves, right? Atone for how they weren't really living the way they wish they would before, mm -hmm. right? And, and I agree with you because I, outside of the sociopaths, some of those poor people don't have a conscience. The rest of us do, and I think we do want to, we do want to live well. We do want to be in alignment. I don't know what your thinking is on this, and exactly like you're saying, there are some people who they don't have a conscience like we do. It's different. So of course, you know, mm -hmm. you know, I don't, I don't hear you and I are are solving at all on this talk for saying, um, well, we should all just be the same. We all have this. Some people just have perhaps less of an ability. When I come down to it and back to how I think and who we all are, how I think we all were created or how we were all created. I don't know. If, yeah, I don't, I don't want to get in the weeds on that too much, but I'll just say it like this. I think to your tune earlier on gratitude, that's probably the word that if I say controls my life, gratitude controls my life. Where does gratitude not control your life? If you choose your inability towards gratitude, you will be caught in stuckness at some level because if you're not grateful, you will basically not participate. Right. If you're not grateful, you will feel stuck. Gratitude. Gratitude moves you directly away from being stuck. 
Gratitude, not so you can see the facts. Let's not get that messed up. See the facts for what they are, but why change all the facts? So back to the 49% average in math or 72, whatever. Why take facts and then apply some bad news to it? We become so proficient in taking a story and turning it into like the bad story. Taking news to like making it bad news. Something to fear. But here's the thing. Humans, what I found find so fascinating, we all say we want to gain in life. But humans, and science proves this, psychology proves this, humans are actually positioned and take energy and participate more with not what they want to gain in opportunity, but more with getting back the things they think they lost. Mm. So we're always, fo- when you think about that, we're focusing on the bottom half of the cup. Yeah. And when we're thinking bottom half of the cup, we're activating survival mechanism. Like I have a little pup. He's Charlie. Right. He's a little multi-poo. He's a cute little poodle. You know, multi-poo, sorry. And I'll tell you what's really interesting. When Charlie looks around, a dog does one thing and it's looking for where is it more safe and where is it most dangerous. That's all it's doing all day. That's what it does. But the human was given the third way of perceiving. And that is currently, like right now, I'm turning my face and looking out the window. I got a banana tree. But I'm just staring at the window. I'm not thinking of anything. Is it safe or is it dangerous? I'm just having a look at the window. The human can do that. The human superpower is take a pause between needing to respond and react and have a knee-jerk reaction. The human has that ability. And so, you know, transcendence. Transcendence happens when we begin to include things. There's so many people that do transcendence and it works by exclusion, but it's very narrow life. Right. Okay. And so if yeah. we, if, if we move into the space of saying, I'm feeling, and so back to the inner world, if we're feeling uncomfortable, this shouldn't be like this. I need to build a boundary. I need to have this set up or this doesn't happen anymore. If we build boundaries that lock us out from appreciating and being grateful for life or doing something incorrectly, probably a helpful boundary mm. Is where we actually create something so that we can be closer with what's going on. We, you know, we just serve notice. Listen, we say society or person, you can keep doing whatever you want. I'm just going to serve you notice when this happens. I will do this because I find it difficult to build a meaningful relationship with you if you always arrive late or whatever that ends up being. And so a helpful boundary is where we build a wall, but it's not like a cement wall. It's a permeable wall where we build a wall saying, yeah. right, like this allows us to connect and get closer. So gratitude, I keep coming back to gratitude, but gratitude is just, you know, the fanciest dancer on the block and it's the most precious thing <laughs> ever. And it, and mm-hmm. it's and it's just a lovely little thing. And I'll tell you something, I came into gratitude. You asked earlier, when you look over at your wife, I came into gratitude because I once tried on life that had so many subtle expectations that eventually my life just didn't work. And I checked out a life for two and a half years. I found a way Mm. to sleep 18 and a half hours a day. I overdosed of melatonin with gravel. I was trying to get away from things. And if you try to get away from things, you are in misery. Try to eliminate never works. You have to utilize. You got to onboard. You know, there's power in the pause. And so I love the work you do. Like I know when you reached out, we connected. I'm like, this is like a special lady. I mean, we're all great, but you got some special. And I love the depth and the heart and the passion and the strength you bring to heavy work. You do it in a light way. And it's just, it's just incredible. I just love it. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I really resonate with what you're saying. It's gratitude and gratitude. Like I tell clients, what I love about gratitude personally Mm -hmm is I can still be pissed off about something. I can still have hurt. I can still have fear and be grateful for these other things. And so it does not deny reality. So what I'm I'm hearing you help your clients do in the pause is to come to acceptance, which may be grieving what's going on in their life, maybe why they made that set of choices, right? How they got here but without the overwhelming fear and the shame, Mm -hmm. right? It's just like, wow, isn't that interesting, right? Observe the thoughts like Mm -hmm. we're taught to do in meditation. Mm -hmm. With compassion, Mm -hmm. like I try to have clients do with compassion. Like, man, take anyone, take you out of the scenario. I bet money, you put some other guy Mm -hmm. in there. He probably would have done probably very similar behaviors because guess what? Trying to survive. And that's what you were talking about earlier, James, about 
getting out of the fight or flight or freak out or F it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because we can't use our prefrontal cortex. We cannot be in touch with our intuition, our feelings. And there's this scientific term, and I need to go look it up because I forget. I, not my gift, right? I'm a conceptual girl. But there's something that happens when we have people empathize and then we come to acceptance around what is and we honor what we feel. We don't fight what we, we feel. We're like, no wonder, no wonder I'm tired and I'm this and I'm that. It's normal, right? Mm-hmm. Right. There's something that clicks in our brain. When we make sense, we go for the solution. Mm-hmm. We automatically go, okay, maybe I want to do this because you help people find clarity and, and you say that you help them take decisive action. So are you seeing the same thing? And is that why you're helping people get quiet first? Spot, spot on. Uh, you said that. I couldn't say it better. That's exactly your inner world controls your exterior world. And what's interesting is so often. So think about first thing you get up in the morning. If you just blast past the time that you might want to spend with yourself. Well, the, the world is noisy. And, and the unique thing is noise can also be fun. Like who doesn't like to go to a concert sometimes and the noise is really mm-hmm. loud. The only thing is if you haven't established a strong signal, if you're not the authority of your life, these things will fill the gaps and you're going to end up resenting them. And you know what? That's helpful. That's good. You end up resenting them because it brings you back to, I'm not saying resentment is good. Don't get me wrong. But what I'm saying is when you have this feeling and it's like, wait a minute, this doesn't feel right. And so you have many choices and I'm not a binary or dualistic person, but for argument's sake, for simplicity's sake, you have, let's just say you have two options. Right. You can either go like, this sucks. I'm just going to turn the noise up louder. Or what you can say is I'm going to ground myself into Mm -hmm. how could it be that all of this is a gift? All of this noise is a concert. How can I let this become a concert again? When I go increase the signal of me. Right build healthy relationship from within, build inner musculature towards gratitude, authentic gratitude, not turning some negative into positive. Why can't I find the space in here? Gosh, you know what, Mary, I'll tell you one thing. When I think of my clients, it's just, and I, and I can only imagine you have similar experience, but when you see your clients experience that they have the capacity to hold things, mm. we have a problem in North America. It's called coddling of the brain or the mind. We actually have more of a capacity than what we think. So here's what we typically do, right? You know, I got two kids, 17 and 15. The 15 has high functioning autism. So Meg and I, you know, we've been parents uh, right from the beginning where we said our kids are here not only for us to, to be there with them and teach them and show them certain things in life, certain things at work and not and just be there to support them. But we're also here to want to learn from them. So we treated them like mini adults the whole, the whole way. Right. And if I think about if we're not careful then we see baby on board in the back of our vehicle, but we do that baby on board and we begin to like overprotect them, helicopter parent everywhere, or even our friends. Right. Because what we often do as humans is we look upon the other person who's handling something and we don't stress test and assess properly if they can handle it. It just brings up mm-hmm. that we can't handle certain things. We go like, oh, they can't handle it. So what we do is we eagerly jump to it. Right. When it, when it, yep. when it, when in essence, if we're most helpful, we wouldn't put our bias towards them. We would, and that's the signal on the internal. If you build that relationship with yourself, you'll feel, oh, this is just me thinking this, this is yes. me projecting on it. So, we, so then of course we've done that work. We can back up off a little bit, the power of the pause. And then we're like, huh, this is really interesting. Then we can make the next decision. And the next decision is, are we going to try to take what's happening here and make it about us again? This is a control. Are we going to, oh, to yeah. somehow make it that we were part of their transformation or part of that we can say we help them? And don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> but here's the thing. There's something right. beautiful in life. And this is what's beautiful. Try this with your kids. Try it with a friend sometime. When they're going through something really stressful, just pause with them and mm-hmm. listen with them and, you know, just, 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 just be with them. Yeah, I can tell that's pretty intense and different things. And then all of a sudden look over at them and go, you know what? I know you can handle this. And they go, really? You think I can? You're like, of course, why not? Mm. And you're not saying it because they have experience in handling it. You're saying it because mm-hmm. they're going to walk into uncertain territory and they're going to experience a rebirth, something on the inside of them going, 
shit, this is who I am. Right. I can handle this. And when they experience that once, twice, three times, they become addicted to it. That's it. It's over. Yep. It takes over. That's it. Your subconscious right. doesn't know the difference between fantasy and reality. But yeah, it does it's take true. over. And it dry, it's driving the damn bus the whole time. Whether, And so... You can go about it one way, like you said, control, like, oh, let me help you. Are you sure you can do that and all that, making it about us? Or we can say, I have no doubt that you will figure this out and, and I'm here with you. And it's just amazing because I don't think they would step up and rise to the bar if they couldn't. And I personally never think that we get ideas about stuff that we can't secretly do. We got to get through the dysfunction and all the crap that's in our way, like the way we ways we keep ourselves stuck. But I don't think things are put on your heart for no reason. I just don't think so. Mm -hmm. I, I just, I, I've never seen it over many years working with clients. I've just never seen that. Well, we tend to think we want to play in spaces that we know about. We, we tend to think we're strongest when we stand on certain ground. Like right. we're certain we're standing on secure ground. We feel like that's the best place. The only thing is this. The experience that lights up from within, how we feel when that blood starts moving in our veins in a different fashion, Yeah. when we lean into the unknown and realize, holy shit, I was okay. Yeah, it was amazing. Like I felt so much. I had a breath. Like I literally changed in this, through this experience. And when we realize that and, and, and then we, we come to the appreciation that, wow, I was building the strengths of my life, what I perceived to be strengths on the known before, on the certainties. But now all of a sudden, it's like, wait a minute. The other half of life is open up to me where I can now build on both the things that I know and the things that I don't know. Exactly. And when I build on the things that I don't know, it actually revivifies me. It's not that certainty is bad. It's just that, you know, we have an overdeveloped muscle towards like we say we're strongest when we know what's going to mm. happen. That's actually bullet, you know, crap. Right. We, we actually realize how strong we are. When, right. <laughs> and when, and not in spite of, but because of. And it's like, that's why we choose those things. And that's how we develop inner respect, mm. confidence, inner strength, inner authority. We don't go and look for other people to recognize us as authority. We become it and we, therefore, we don't need to feel threatened if other people poke us and say, you're, you're no good. Exactly. It doesn't matter. That, that's their opinion, right? right. So Because it's us believing in ourselves. And what I'm hearing you say is us coming to acceptance of what is and being grateful for the lessons and the gifts of everything. And also trusting and loving ourselves and allowing ourselves to choose and I believe you go from fear to choice, you're good, right? When, yeah. when you get into choice, mm -hmm. no one can run your life anymore. You get to decide. Mm -hmm. Of course, you're in reality, and that's that's mm -hmm. not always a bad thing, right? Mm -hmm. Getting clarity is about, okay, what is, and now what can I do? Well, and I love exactly that point, and you brought it back just beautifully to that reality piece, because reality, I believe is here's the emotion that I'm feeling mm -hmm. and it feels really sucky. But if you can onboard that, see, you stay away from fantasy, right? You don't, you don't change the facts. You don't, you don't doctor the books like Enron did and say, you're better than that. You're better than the numbers reveal. That doesn't work. Right. But when you stay aligned with it, imagine this, somebody says you suck. And actually the truth is, I mean, we all know there's a benign and hostile side to everything. Mm -hmm. Why does it threaten me if you were to say to me, I suck? The truth is, yeah, I am great and I also mm -hmm. suck sometimes. It's mm -hmm. true, I do. And so, see, that's that's the musculature that will reveal itself at the right time if you build that muscle before the day begins. See, that You don't have to be constantly defending yourself. You're like, you tell me whatever you want. Plus, you know what the cool thing is? You don't say you tell me whatever you want and then you build a wall, meaning you don't let them in. What happens is when they say this, mm -hmm. When you accept it in yourself, you're like, yeah, that might be true and that might not be true. But only thing that that person is saying is some people in the world feel that way. Right. And because you accept it, now you can have empathy towards what they're talking about. So if anything, they're bringing you a rich emotion. You, you know, you don't have to like bring it into you and like brand it on your arm saying I suck. But they're just reminding the other way of looking at it. And this, this is a bit of a conversion. I don't often convert like this because I don't like to take facts and twist them. But it's like this. You know what? We all want our ego container to grow, meaning our ability to handle more. We want that to mm -hmm. grow. Why don't we celebrate when people throw rocks at our ego? Mm -hmm. 
Meaning they're helping us. They're reminding us, don't get too high on your smoke, bro. Don't get too high on your smoke. <laughs> it's like if they say I suck, I'm like, yeah, that's true. I, You know what? I do kind of suck. That's true. Sometimes I do. And it's like, because here's the thing. we Who are we? Are we a god or are we a right. human? We're a human. Right. And so we are allowed to make mistakes and it's not good or bad news. But that's that's the beauty that when we feel this, we're like, I can handle the fact that I made this mistake. Like think about back to the criminal, the one that's in the jail cell who committed the crime. If they if they can just come through that experience and been like, oh, I didn't really help society and I took the long road to love, I can do a better way now. Mm -hmm. It's like if, if their ego container can relate in their experience and they can choose to be grateful that society says we're, we're, we are going to show you this isn't beneficial. Right. It's like, wow, this is incredible. What happens is their ego container grows and then when they get released, they can be truly beneficial members of society exactly. again. So the whole thing is accepting the emotion, accepting, accepting it. Because why do we need to, I'm coming back to this, but why do we need to be so threatened so quickly, so on the edge when somebody says something that we're like, oh, this really, it's like, how shallow of people are we? But I, but I, but I want to just tone this right back and just, I want to empathize with all the listeners who can't seem, but just be so so flinchish towards things. I get that place. Yeah. I've been there. I know exactly. And I was so fl like, seriously, it was so pathetic for me. So before I checked out of life, like I was saying, when somebody shook my hand and they didn't squeeze it the way that I thought mm -hmm. they were actually saying that we like mm -hmm. you or they didn't look at me properly, I was solving for that I'm not enough constantly. So I know what that looks right. like. It was horrible. It was hell. I know. So I don't want to bring humor to it. Be like, oh, crazy. You're not there. That's not the idea. The idea is I get you. I understand you. There's many people who've been through this journey. As a matter of fact, the emotions that you're feeling have been experienced by someone on this earth, guaranteed. Right. And guess what? You can choose to fight and eliminate those emotions, or you can let those things pierce you and let them change you because of these things. And there are people like Mary, like myself, there's other people, wherever you choose to go, they're great people. Just find someone. If, 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 if I'd say anything, Find someone who can be a guide that's deeply steeped in reality. Don't let yourself do personal development so that it supports building your ego. That's what some people do. I know. They build their ego so we're better than and we don't have to be amongst those people. Listen, why do you? Why do we grow as people so that we can disassociate ourselves mm -hmm. from the reality of life? Listen, life is messy. And we ourselves are messy. So what? We've come through a journey and then we're like, we never want to go back there again. Like think about the person who, for example, commits the, you know commits the murder. Often, if he does something that he feels mm -hmm. drawn to and does the natural thing, he'll find himself supporting people mm -hmm. who have been in similar places like him because he chose empathy towards his own life, and that's why he can do it towards them. That's the good yes. news. We redeem our suffering. We bring purpose. Yes. We re we repurpose our suffering because it's all good. It's here to serve us. Oh, thank you. I love that. Wow. Thank you so much for being here, James, this has been amazing. And what a wonderful gift that you have for helping people come to you themselves and, and work on finding a way to do that almost effortlessly is what it, it sounds like that you're describing it. And it's really a beautiful thing that self acceptance, that self love, finding your purpose, I agree with you. I would say 99% of the people I've worked with over many years all want that. We all want the same stuff. So how can people find you, James, if they want to work with you and do some great stuff here? Awesome. Thanks for asking. Just simply go to my website, uh, www.jameshepner.com. And so I'll spell that. Just uh, slow it right down. J-A-M-E-S-H-E-P-P. NER.com. And there you'll find my podcast. I have a bit of a blog. You'll see some of the work that I do. And you want to have just a conversation with me or tap into some work. You want to subscribe. You can you can choose to do as you wish. I'd be honored to, to have a conversation with you or just even drop uh, Mary or me a line after this podcast. Go to our websites, whatever, and just say, hey, I enjoyed the show. You know, this is, this is work that I know I've given my life to and I know Mary has too. So again, Mary, I'm just honored and grateful that I got to be here. And, uh, you, know, I, you know, I hope uh, that I could even bring just a sliver of value to your audience. You know, I'm just grateful I could be here. Thank you. Thank you. So grateful for you to be here. And I definitely want to have you on the show again. Take care, James. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks. Well, thank you, James, again, for being here. That was quite an incredible conversation about some very important stuff. 
I hope you found some good takeaways listening to James and I today. I know I did. If you want to check out his podcast or hire him as a results coach, you can find James at www.jameshepner.com and his information will be in the show notes. All right, so pay it forward, keep focusing on you, and I'll see you next time. We hope you took away some useful insights and tools you can begin using right away. If you did, please leave a positive review and share on your social media. Because could you imagine if everyone in your life really got it together? Remember, own it now, so you can really own it later.